Hey everybody, it's Eric from Barrel and Hatchet, and thank you for checking out another Hatchet Cast episode here on YouTube. And today we're going to be talking about the journey of the pistol shooter. And um, that pistol shooter is going to be me. Uh, I'm going to talk about my humble beginnings when it came to uh, shooting pistol and my early on things that I learned and some of the gear that I used along the way. Um, and then also, you know, where I progressed and where I want to be. So uh, I think it's really cool telling your story. Um, you know, throughout human history, we have passed on information and historical legend and things like that through stories. So I'm going to be talking about my pistol journey, and it would be awesome to hear about your pistol journey as well. So make sure you guys comment below on where your humble beginnings were and where you're at now and some goals that you guys have for the future. As far as the channel and how to support it, make sure you guys subscribe. It really does actually help out. We found that only 30% of the people who watch the videos that we put or produce are subscribed. So subscribing really makes a difference. And then if you get something out of this, share it with a friend. Hit the notification bell. It lets you know whenever we do have a new episode dropping. For those who are new to the channel, we drop an episode every Monday at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this and talk to you guys about the journey of the pistol shooter. So in the, in the early days, I, you know, just like everybody does, I started off as a collector. Um, <clears throat> my first gun was an, a Beretta 90 dash two 40 Cal. I know. Um, but <laughs> it's it kind of funny looking back back then I was like, cause we had Berettas in the service and I was like, Oh, this is a cooler, sleeker version. It has a pick rail so I can hold a light on it. Um, and, uh, it was the 90 dash two. I actually enjoyed Berettas. I still, I still enjoy Berettas, but, um, so Beretta, if you, if you watch the video, send me a Beretta, just kidding. But, um, the, uh, the 90 dash two was good. The caliber was terrible. Um, 40 cal is just, in my opinion, this is my opinion, uh, nine mil is far superior. Um, and I think a lot of departments are switching away from 40 cal, the FBI is switching away from 40 cal. So there's a lot of evidence to show that nine mil can achieve almost the same and better results ballistically, um, recoil control, you know, capacity for your mag, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, I started off as a, as a, as a collector. I mean, you know, the standard collector items you get, the Mosin Nagant, some crazy mill surplus rifle, um, you know, the shotgun, the lever gun, that type of stuff. So I started off as a collector. Um, and then I remember being in my team room and, uh, a buddy of mine came up to me. He's like, dude, check up here. Pull up. He's like, pull up YouTube, which YouTube back then I think was owned by YouTube. It wasn't owned by Google, but, um, he, uh, he was like, pull this up. And he showed me this, these videos of this guy shooting really fast. And it was only like two minutes long. And it was Lucas from T-Rex Arms. So it was interesting to see a civilian, you know, running the gun like that, um, running around in kit and, and, um, making it was all like whoa like you know some guys in this you know were like ah oh, that's you know he's he's posing he's he should have joined the military blah, blah blah but there are other guys especially those of us who like to shoot who enjoyed shooting who are like wow he's actually pretty pretty fast it's just something that we hadn't seen before um the also thing is we also had like the magpul videos came out you know and that was like a big deal uh, those Magpul videos coming out and the art of the ca dynamic carbine and the art of the shotgun. And I think also I had the old uh, Viking Tactics DVDs from Kyle Lamb, which was really, really good, uh, you know, and uh, that kind of set me off on my training journey to really dive into guns more, you know, as, you know, starting off as a collector with like Mosins and an AK and, uh, you know, a Beretta 90-2 and all this random stuff, I started to look at my inventory. I'm like, I want to get something that I just have that I can train with. And I just use that one thing. Um, and then the other thing is also I wanted to get an AR because I had an M4 in the service and I wanted to get a lot better with it because it, it actually directly correlated and affected my, my regular job. So, um, I wanted to get good at those skill sets. Um, so I went to the store and I went and bought a, uh, originally this is, or let me back up when I had started training, we were issued Blackhawk Serpa holsters that were the drop leg double strap. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was cool back in the day. And then uh, I ended up switching over to a Safari Land with the hood for my M9, and it was a double strap holster. And dude, I remember I had to crank those straps down to get that thing to not flop all over the place. And I remember tried hiking that holster as high as humanly possible up on my leg and cranking down the straps on that leg. Uh, holster to be able to prevent it from moving to the point where like my blood circulation was it was like it was like two tourniquets um so i ended up going and i had taken an old usgi green belt and um this is back in the acu days and uh made like zip tied and put molly pouches on that belt and that was my first battle belt um i had a dump drop leg dump pouch from tactical tailor on the other side it was just like back then that was like the cool thing, you know? Um, and so like this old school type of Jerry rig setup that I had, and that was my first belt that I was using for training and actually like getting, trying to get faster. Um, and my wife, she had actually bought me a blue pocket pro timer shot, shot timer for Christmas. And, uh, (laughs) I was running like my times and like, you know, looking for courses and just eager to eat up as any type of training whatsoever, like just eager to eat anything up. So watching YouTube, uh, early YouTube videos, watching a lot of like watching the VTAC DVDs over and over and over again, watching the Magpul videos over and over again, and, uh, just putting into practice those reps with developing my own style and, and, you know, sucking the information from those, those, uh, those DVDs to develop a baseline. Um, and so, you know, I started putting together like events for shooting for, for the squadron and stuff like that, um, and running drills and other things of that nature. And I just got hooked, man. Like I, I got really hooked and wanting to be, um, fast. So a lot of, a lot of people assume you know, like military, especially like in, in, in specialty jobs, like, you know, Green Berets or SEALs or special warfare, uh, all of those types of jobs. A lot of people think like, oh man, they're all shooters. Like they're all really, really good. And yes, that is true. There are a lot of great shooters out there, but not every person that's in those jobs is a gun guy. Guns are just a part of the job and just something that you have to do. Um, but it doesn't mean that they are a gun guy. There's so many qualifications and there's so many other skill sets that they have to keep up with. Uh, and firearms just happens to be one of them. Um, one of many different skill sets. And there are some gun guys actually out there who serve in those, in those career fields. And I just, I just became a gun guy. Like I just got really hooked on it. Um, and so, what I ended up doing is uh, HSGI High Speed Gear had actually come out with a padded belt because the USGI belt I was using was like really digging in my hips. There's no padding. If you guys, for guys who've worn those in the past, like in basic training and stuff like that, um, they're really not, they're not very forgiving uh, on your hips. So I got this HSGI belt and it was like grippy and it had molly all the way around it. And I put like all my pouches and my, uh, my drop leg holster, my Safari Land and I had that thing rigged out. I had suspenders for it. And I love that belt, dude. Like I ran that belt so much. Um, And uh, that was kind of like the beginning of like me building out a battle belt rig. Um, So at that time, after I had that belt, um, I think I still had the Beretta 90-2. And um, I had just taken different pouches. I think I had like two pistol mag pouches and a couple M4 pouches and then like other things that were involved like JTAC style pouches for that type of equipment. So I had that stuff on there as well. Um, and then I, you know, I ran that for a while, but eventually it got to a point where it was just too bulky. And so I ended up doing a training event with the unit that I'm actually with now. Um, and their, their guys were actually really into shooting at the time. Like, and, and they still are. I'm, I'm actually at that squadron now, but they're really into shooting and really, really good. And, uh, I was, I I like went and just like, was like, give me your knowledge. I've been so hungry. And all these guys were shooters and super, super into and professional and, you know, had a solid baseline. And they actually gave me a good solid baseline performance for like holster draw, you know, kind of corrected me on some things I had been doing wrong, some bad habits that I had. And so, uh, they were wearing, these Velcro belts that they had actually made from Walmart. So what they would do is they would take the, the about inch wide, um, inch and a half or two inch wide Velcro, 
from Walmart and long strips. And they actually would take, if you actually see like a, uh, go to the craft section in Walmart and they have these like craft boards that are like flexible plastic. They have like grid lines on them. And they actually cut those into strips and they put that in between the soft portion of the Velcro, like the hook. And they put that, that the rigid portion in there and then laid a, uh, a loop piece on top of it. And they meld these, made these Velcro straps and they would slide their pouches onto them. And they also had made another one for their inner belt. So these guys had made this Velcro belt, Jerry rigged from Walmart. And it prevented the belt from moving around. And I was blown away because I'm like, dude, that was the one problem I had with the HSGI belt that was padded was anytime I would draw off, I pulled from a pouch, it would lift the belt off my waist and it wouldn't be nice and tight and it would just move around. So I was like, that's awesome. Um, and so I, I, started, I actually went and made my own and uh, they, they taught me how to make my own. And, um, and so I ran that for several years of just running this, this, homemade DIY Velcro belt. And uh, I actually ended up going to a surplus store and they had this uh, belt from Raptor Tactical. Um, And it was just a simple Molly belt, had the inner and outer. And I was like, I'm going to go official and I'm going to buy a legit belt. Um, Around that time, you know, when I had the Velcro jerry rig belt that I made, I had actually switched to a Glock 19 Gen 3 and I was running it stock, iron sights. Um, I always ran all of my stuff stock for all that time and um, ended up having a X300 Surefire light. It was the first generation, so it literally was only 300 lumens um, and uh, was about as bright as a candle. Um, but it was cool back then, you know, as like groundbreaking type stuff back in the day. And so I ended up getting a, uh, a Safari Land ALS holster for that gun. Um, and it was actually on the recommendation of those guys that I trained with that had the Jerry rig belts and they were all running Safari land and they were talking about why it better and Blackhawk, they were starting to, def- you know, figure out that there was that issue with the, the locking mechanism on the Serpa holsters where it was dangerous because you would depress the lock on the holster and you would draw and it would put your finger near that trigger well. Um, so I actually seen a dude that indeed with a 1911 and a Blackhawk Serpa because he pulled it out and his finger deep pressing the locking button, he was trying to go fast. And the, the, his finger actually went into the 1911 and, uh, and, and shot himself, obviously safety issue and all that type of stuff. But, um, still that kind of opened my eyes. So I decided to get a Safari land ALS holster and uh, it was for a Glock and for a light. And, um, I also, um, at that time, like serrated slides like Zev was just now coming out. And I was like, man, it's so much money for a trigger. But my buddy was who I shot with was like, dude, you got to get a Zev trigger. And so I was like, okay. And I felt his and I was like, man, that's a legit gun. And like Zev was, was super awesome at the time. Well, I mean, they're still good, but like they were groundbreaking, you know what I'm saying? So like, um, they had all these different slides that were come down, had come out with different serrations and ports and, and all these things. And, um, I was like, dude, some of these slides and these barrels, I can't afford it. You know, um, I've already been spending money on other types of gear. Cause I'm also a gear nerd. Um, and so I was like, well, I can at least get the trigger. I think it's a good investment. And, um, so I bought a Zev trigger for this gen three Glock 19. And I also got a, uh, um, a Zev Magwell, which is like a hundred bucks. So I got this Magwell and to help my reloads and bought some Terran tactical base plates for the, my 19. So I ran that for a while. I mean, I, I mean, I ran that for a while and I had replaced my, um, my iron sights with Trigicon tritium iron sights. So that way they were like night sights and, uh, had just gotten really, really good shooting irons. And I, you know, it did well with the, my Beretta shooting stuff and in the military and just, I just gotten really good with irons. Um, so, um, I ran that for a, a good while and was, uh, eventually a friend of mine actually gave me a, uh, a slide from Grey Ghost Precision, and it had the mill cut out for, it was milled out for a uh, red dot. And so it had the uh, base plate cover on there. And I was like, man, you know, like, I don't know, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, uh, 
um, go to red dot. I might get worse at my iron sights and, uh, I don't have a holster for it. And now holster costs a lot of money. And so I ended up, um, you know, just procrastinating about it, coming with every excuse as to why to not to switch to a red dot. Um, and, uh, so anyways, I was just super excited about having a slide that had serrations on the front of it. And uh, my cousin had actually given me a Silencer Co. barrel for that Glock 19. So I had this threaded barrel. You know, I was like, I'm pretty freaking cool. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm super happy with things. I actually, a friend of mine was like, hey, man, you got to freaking stipple your gun. That was like a big deal. Like, like you know, people were getting their gun stippled and grinding out the trigger well area. And I was like, oh, man, maybe I should try that. So I started doing that and just getting real comfortable shooting that Glock. And I had very regimented type of movements. Like I would, you know, for a four stage holster draw, I was hitting every single point, very, very methodical, uh, not so much for speed, but making sure that I was doing everything right and doing everything clean. Um, and then obviously, you know, doing training with other, uh, you know, and on the military side, doing training with other guys and, and some Green Beret buddies, and they were teaching me footwork and stuff that would be similar for a shoot house. So I'm learning all of these things and just absorbing all this information and trying to develop my own style. Um, and so um, I ended up getting out of the service on active and, and transitioning to part-time and then, you know, coming down to Florida and uh, hooked up with um, Ben from Wiseman Company to start working at JTAC Ranch. And he had, you know, we'd shot together and I had actually attached a a red dot that I had. It was, it was a Trigicon RMR, but it was not able to be adjusted. It was just like auto on and auto sense brightness and stuff like that to my slide. And... Um, I just didn't have a holster for it, so I never used it. So I had, I just kept running iron sights. Um, and uh, oh, pause real quick on that. So going back a little bit to the Zev trigger, I ended up going to, uh, you know, had some SWAT buddies, and they invited me out to a SWAT shoot. And I, you know, we're doing drills, and I'm and I'm running my my Glock 19 with the Zev trigger, and um, I go to draw, and when I draw and I fire that first round, it goes. Brrr, and does a, like shoots like nine rounds full auto, and uh, I was like, "What the frick?" And uh, everybody looks at me, and I'm like, "Ah, this is just a standard Glock 19, like you know." But it ended up being where because that that trigger was set so light, because you could adjust how short the reset you wanted it to be, you could adjust the length of pull, like you could adjust all kinds of not length of pull, but like you could adjust how much that trigger pretty heavily. Um, and so after that, I took that thing out of there and stuck a stock trigger back in it. I was so embarrassed. And, uh, and the guys actually were at the SWAT dudes were actually really, really cool. And they helped me swap the, swap the trigger and put a Glock, a standard Glock one in there that I had in my, uh, my kit. And so ever since then, I never shot modified triggers again. Um, I always shot just stock triggers with, in my pistol specifically, uh, I, I shoot, I shoot, you know, enhanced triggers for, for ARs, but for the pistol, I only shot stock and I still shoot only stock triggers to this day. Um, so going back to, uh, you know, when I met, met up with Ben and he's like, dude, just switch to the red dot, get a freaking holster, get an ALS holster for that thing and switch to a red dot. And I was like, ah, you know, him and Han, maybe I should, maybe I should in, and maybe I'll get slower at irons. Like, you know, I'm going to have a dip in performance. And uh, if you guys ever know or have ever been to one of our classes, I usually talk about plateaus and dips in performance. And I actually stole this from another instructor. I went to a, a course with Esoteric, and they were, you know, taught me this this method or this um, this analogy. And I, I've always loved it. I think it's a great it's a great way to show how you burst through your plateaus. So essentially every shooter plateaus at a certain point. So like you train, you train, you train, but eventually you plateau at a certain level. And what happens is, is you go to a class and you take training and you either, uh, when you take that training and you're exposed to new knowledge, you will have a dip in performance because now you're trying to implement something new that you've never done. And when you have that dip in performance, um, 
you know, that dip in performance outside of new training can also come in from new equipment. So like switching from iron sights to a red dot, I had that dip in performance, I had gotten comfortable on this plateau, gotten really good on irons and was running pretty quick, for what I thought, and um, had plateaued. And so when I had switched over to the red dot, I had this massive dip in performance, right? So when I when you're at that dip in performance, and you're at that bottom level, there's two decisions that you have to make. Um, you know, either that person can say, you know what, this is not for me, I'm going back to iron sights, or hey, you know, these methods that you're teaching in class are not for me, it doesn't work for me, what I was doing before here on this plateau worked for me, then you go back to your plateau, and you just move on with your day, like essentially, you never grow, you just stay on the same plateau, because you're never willing to um, make that decision. Now, if you put in the training at the bottom, you know, of that of that dip in performance, and you, um, you know, put in the time, and you put in the ammo, eventually, what's going to happen is you're going to burst through your plateau, you're going to re plateau again, and then you're going to rinse and repeat that process. So I, I experienced a dip in performance. And um, I got a holster, a Safari Land holster, which by the way, we have a discount code for them in the, in the description. It's pretty wild to, to think that <laughs> we were a part of their, uh, their program now. But um, we experienced, I experienced a huge dip in performance and I spent like three months straight just freaking training to find the dot. Went to a vigor training uh, course specifically with red dots. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but Phil is an incredible instructor. If you guys have not taken a, a course of vigor training, you should definitely go take one. But, you know, Ben also was, was kind of like that pace man for me. Um, so, you know, I'd always been in my shooting circle in North Carolina and on the military side, I'd always been like the top shot. Like I'd always been the fastest, the most accurate speed, clean, blah, blah, blah. But I never had a pace man. So I was always the guy at the top of the, of the group when it came to shooting. So coming down to Florida and having somebody that's out shooting me faster than me, you know, runs, runs things more efficiently. It was refreshing for me because I was like, finally, I have a pace man and I can absorb knowledge from him, from Ben and be able to develop my own style and continue to push myself. So switching to that red dot, um, literally changed my life when it came to shooting pistols. Um, so I ran a, um, that RMR and just kept shooting and shooting and shooting. And eventually it got to a point where I was shooting that Glock 19 so much, the round count was getting up there that I was having failures to, you know, failures to feed, failures to cycle, uh, and just having a lot of stuff. The springs just wear out, like, right? So, um, you know, I didn't really like the dot because I couldn't aim with night vision because it was just too bright. Like it wouldn't dim down enough. I was not allowed, I, it, like it wouldn't even let me have a button to dim it down enough to be able to shoot at night with night vision and aim with the dot. So I was just like, I need to eventually upgrade my red dot. So I ended up going over to gun shop and that's where, you know, I, I'd known Roy for a little while and I bought a Glock 45 from Roy. They had just come out at the time. Um, ended up getting a Glock 45 from Roy and he was like, Hey man, you need to get a Hollis on 507. It's cheap. Um, you know, this Glock 45 is actually used because somebody w had bought it. They didn't really want to run it anymore. And then they just brought it back. So I was like, perfect fricking, you know, I'll do that. Uh, so I got this, this Glock 45 with a Hollis on 507. It already fits inside of my, um, inside of my holster and, you know, Ben had given me a, a Surefire X300 Ultra. So I was like, upgrade my 300 lumens to a thousand lumens, uh, which is nice and a game changer. And, uh, I ended up giving my Glock 45 to a buddy of mine, Cody, and he ended up milling out the, uh, slide. And it was funny as he was like, dude, this was actually an accident. Um, but he had the, cause a Glock 45 didn't have any, anything, no mill, mill, it wasn't milled out for a dot. It was just such a good deal. It was like, well, Ben was like, Hey man, we can get it milled out and then you can put a dot on there. So anyways, I gave it to Cody and Cody mills it out, but he messed up on the dimensions. So it actually, where the rear sight goes, that was the back side of, he like had it milled where the back sight usually goes. So the, the sight was pushed all the way to the back. And, um, he was like, Oh crap. Like I have it where your, your, your dot is all the way to the rear of the slide. And then now I'm, I'll mill you another, 
uh, area for the rear sight, and it'll just be the rear sight will be in front of your dot. Well, I was like, man, I'm 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 not even using these iron sights, so I freaking just didn't even mount the iron sights in there. And he he had it seracoded for me, and uh, um, I was just super happy about it. So, anyways, I ran that Glock 45, and that year, man, me and Ben and Roy, man, we we probably ran. It was thousands and thousands of rounds, um, thousands of rounds. I mean, it was a a lot, a freakishly large number of ammo that we were we were running in those guns, and um, I still had the silencer code barrel. I stuck that in my G forty five, and what was cool was because the dot was um, so far back to the rear of the slide, even with my um, my barrel, I was still able to fit it inside that holster with that, with that threaded barrel. So that was really, really nice. Um, and I, I ran that so heavily. And so, you know, I had that, I also ran the vigor training red dot course. And I, I also did a couple of vehicle courses with him. Um, and one thing that was really cool is in his course, he has a force on force, um, portion. And so what he does, is he has sim rounds and it's, you're, you're fighting with another, you know, student in class and, one student has an iron sights uh, Glock. The other one has a red dot Glock, and they're all shooting Sims. And literally the entire class, myself included, when it came to running the iron sight gun, when it was our turn to run that gun for the force on force, nobody aimed once. We just point shot. Um, because your brain is staying so target fixated that you're not going to focus on those iron sights. You're just going to be fixated on the threat and engage it as fast as you can. Um, so what was crazy though is 80% of the class, 80 or excuse me, 80% of the class, almost 80% of the time ran the red dot and actually aimed and saw a dot whenever we were doing those force on force drills. So the dot literally was working to the benefit of the shooter to help them be target fixated. And in fact, if you were more target fixated, you were more successful at finding the dot. So that was really, really cool. Um, seeing that distinction. And that's something that I still talk about and bring to, you know, the barrel and hatchet pistol, red dot pistol class to this day. Um, you know, learning that foundation from, from Phil at Vigor, uh, was so, so groundbreaking for me in my journey that it really, really helped me design my own style as a shooter and helped me to, to become better. Um, and so it's, it's instructors like that. And he's, he's also one where he can perform a standard on demand. And that's something I think is huge for instructors. Like if you're going to be instructing, you need to be able to perform the standards that you ask people to do. You have to perform on demand. Um, it's not like a lucky fluke or you never perform them or whatever. Like, so that, that stuck with me. So I wanted to be that instructor. Also, if I say I'm going to do a set of standards, I'm going to do them and I'm going to do them right now on demand and not try 15 times to try and hit this standard and still not be able to do it. So I think if you're going to ask somebody to perform a standard, you need to be also able to perform the standard or otherwise you have no reason to ask them to do that. So anyways, um, I ended up switching, uh, you know, I had the 507 on that Glock 45, and then I eventually switched over the 509T from Hollow Sun came out. And if you guys haven't seen our Red Dot Fiasco video, go check that out, the enclosed emitter one. But we were all, we all got the Red Dot, the 509T at the same time. And we were like, man, enclosed emitters is the freaking future. And it was amazing. It ran so well for like six months. And then all of our dots started breaking um, around the same time. And we would get moisture inside the emitter and all that type of stuff. I, I, I go in depth in it on another episode. That's the, uh, enclosed emitter video. And I actually have that video, um, at the very end of the uh, video, whenever it gives you like a video, like, Hey, we recommend this. I'll make sure it's that red dot, uh, enclosed emitter fiasco video. So we ran those. And then after that, that busted down and we had, we ended up switching back to a non enclosed emitter. Um, Roy was like, dude, you got to switch to SRO. It's a circle. It's better. <laughs> so I ended up switching to an SRO and I was like, holy smokes, it changed the game for me. It made it so much more. I just love that dot. And so I ran a five Oh way. I still run the same exact SRO today. Um, but it's a five MOA dot. 
and um, was super, super happy and was running for a long time that Glock 45 with a Trigicon SRO on it. And still, you know, like pushing myself, pushing speed, trying to continue to push, have good form, but at the same time push the levels of performance where I'm trying to get faster, right? My goal was to be just under 1.10 for my draw time now. And now I'm like trying to push a second, but like, um, <clears throat> and I'll talk about that portion here in, in a bit, but so I ended up, uh, shooting that Glock 45 for such a long time or a long time. I had it for like two years. And then, um, I had just shot, I had shot so much with that gun that now it was hitting a point where the springs were wearing out. And I understand, like, within our group, like me, Roy, Ben, Chris, you know, a couple other, Zach, and a couple other buddies, we all had Glock 45s. <laughs> like, we were all, and we were, and the guys we were shot with, we were all pushing guys, like, go Glock 45, get a Glock. You know, there's so many guys that switched to Glocks and stuff like that. Um, and so we kind of started that trend within our community. And um, I started having failures to feed, failures to eject. Um, essentially I had literally shot that gun till all the springs were worn out and I had to replace pretty much everything inside the gun. Like I had, you know, thousands upon thousands of rounds racked up on that pistol to, it was to the point where I was like, okay, it's time to replace all the inside guts of this thing. And so what was cool is also I shot that gun stock trigger, um, the trigger was stock, but I had shot it so much that it felt like a modified trigger, like a polished trigger. So guys that would pull, like, test fire to dry fire, they're like, holy smokes, who did your trigger job? And I was like, nah, man, I just kept shooting it, and it just broke in really good. So, like, with Glocks, if you keep shooting that stock trigger, it gets better and better and better over time. Um, but anyways, Roy's like, hey, man, I'm just kind of, you know, maybe I was looking at this MMP, and we were looking at uh, Berettas for a little while, but we couldn't find any holsters to support a Beretta with a light and a red dot. And so he was like, I'm looking at this MMP metal that just came out. It's pretty legit and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, no, no. I don't want to switch pistols. I'm already teaching all the time. I'm teaching pistol classes. I don't want to have another dip in performance in the middle of my A game and trying to learn a new pistol and different grip and all this type of stuff. It's Roy's fault that I switched to MMP metal. Uh, and so I ended up switching over the MMP metal 2.0. And I freaking fell in love with it. We actually did a video on on the MMP 2.0. Uh, you guys can check it out on the channel. But I fell in love with it. And I stuck an SRO on it, got a new holster uh, for the MMP. And um, I actually upgraded it to a Surefire X300 Vampire light so I could run it for night vision stuff, which has the IR. It's a head that can turn. And it allows you to do like IR mode, white light, and then actually turn the entire light off where even if you depress the levers, it won't turn on. You won't ND your light. So I ended up switching over to that. And um, I also now got a Griffin Armament threaded barrel with a micro comp and I had actually ran a micro comp on my Glock. Um, you know, I had, I had for a long time wanted to run comps, but I was like, I don't know. And so the micro comp is really nice because it's like a thread protector, but it also does take a little bit of that bite of the recoil off. So I run that now on my MMP metal and I love that gun. Um, it is so nice having a metal lower and a, um, and metal mags, like they come out faster. They, uh, the slide it articulates very, very well. The grips are adjustable and it's super, extremely aggressive grip. Uh, it's just an awesome gun. I love it. And so also ended up getting a Smith & Wesson 2.0 metal competition, which is their 5-inch version that has uh, slide cuts and, and slide ports. And uh, the other one I had is a four and a quarter. So those are the two guns that I'm running now. And so what I'm doing now is, as far as my journey and where I want to go, um, you know, I'm trying to now push the limits of performance and be consistent. So like if I'm pushing, you know, a standard, I want to be able to do the standard over and over and over again. I'm working on my grip because grip out of all the fundamentals is the most important in my opinion. Um, and so getting good at doing doubles, real tight doubles under speed, um, doing transition from target to target and also having tight doubles under speed. So those are the types of things that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. And as you go along on your pistol journey, kind of like weight loss, when you're at the gym, if you're super, super, super overweight, you see big gains in the beginning, but as you get slimmer and slimmer and more fit, you end up seeing it, it's a lot harder work to get that 
next level of performance, that next, that next look that you're trying to achieve. It's the same thing with shooting in general. Like you end up, you know, seeing massive gains and now I'm going to classes or I'm reading stuff. Like I'm actually going to order a book from Ben Stoger. He's an incredible fast shooter, USPSA world champion. Um, and also learning from guys like, uh, Jeff Cramblett and, you know, and, and those types of guys who are really, really fast at performance space shooting, um, throw out another couple of guys, Nick from Velox and, and Joe Farewell, um, you know, JBS training group. And there's just tons of great shooters out there. Um, and so learning from them, so that way I can get an edge on getting those tenths of seconds off my time and also to be more and more consistent. So that's where you start to go whenever you're going down that road of your journey where, you know, where I came from, those humble beginnings to where I'm at now, it's incredible to see. And um, it's something that, you know, I'm always going to strive to become faster, to be to be better. Um, one thing that I've always told myself is I don't want to buy performance, meaning I don't want to buy a bunch of upgrades and a super fast race gun. I want to learn on the basics and run things stock and then graduate into, uh, you know, those guns where I can run faster speeds. If you have the money to do it, then do it. But, um, that's the one thing I think a lot is within the gun community. We, we, there are folks that try to buy that performance and there's no, you know, there's, you can't buy a black belt. You got to work hard. You got to put in the time, put in the round count, put in the dry fire. And that's how you end up, you know, getting better. Um, so anyways, that's, you know, my next journey is to, like I said, continue to be faster, to be more consistent, to be more accurate. Um, and yeah, I, I enjoy pistol shooting so much. So if you guys enjoyed that pistol episode and you guys want to come train with us, make sure you come and train with us. We love training with you guys. We do have red dot pistol courses coming up and fighting carbine. We're also going to be doing collaborations with other instructors. We really, really want to start collabing with instructors and working together. Um, because there's a ton of people that need training and there's a ton of, you know, room to be able to grow together. And there's, uh, you know, we just want to be a unifying force where we unify with other folks versus, you know, fighting against and competing with other, with other companies. So we are super excited for that. Um, if you guys want to see behind the scenes type stuff or see flat lays of different equipment or hear about different topics, go check out our Instagram, our Spotify and our X account. Um, we are being more active and we're very active on all those platforms. We're even talking about going on to Twitch for Pete's sake. So, um, yeah, I'm really terrible at, at video games, but, um, we'll, we'll do it for, for the amusement of all of you. Um, so anyways, make sure you guys go out and train. That's the biggest thing. Um, you know, whether you go and train with us or you find another good instructor, to go train with the key is invest in yourself. And also with that training, um, you can, you can do that where it's the same as buying performance. You can't just pay for a bunch of classes, you know, like I'm going to go to 15 classes this month and expect to be better. You have to put in the time and, and, and chew on all that knowledge that you're given. And then you put in the time, the dry fire, applying those techniques and applying those methodologies. And that's how you get better. And then once you hit that plateau, now it's time to take another class, right? So to get that next little bit. So make sure you guys are investing yourself. Make sure you go and train. 2024 is the year to invest in yourself and to train, especially with the way things are in the world right now. And uh, yeah, anyways, guys, make sure you're safe out there. Make sure you're trained to be the asset, not the liability. And we'll see you on the next one.